Esther van der Naaf, well, she, thank you very much for presenting today. And she received a, her bachelor and master mm -hmm. in plant pathology from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Her PhD in genetics from the Plant Research Laboratory at Michigan State University and her postdoctoral training in plant breeding at Cornell University. She has been at Ohio State University from 2001 to 2015, advancing to the ranks to associate professor in the Department of Horticulture and Crop Science. From 2012 to 2015, Dr. Van der Naaf mm -hmm. held an affiliated scholar position at the College of Worcester. Then since 2015, she's a professor at the University of Georgia, Athens in the Department of Horticulture, as well as in the Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics and Genomics. She's an adjunct professor in genetics and plant biology at UCI. And the research in her lab focuses on genetic, molecular, and cellular basis of tomato fruit morphology, which also includes the characterization and quantification of fruit shapes and sizes. She has published over 80 peer review articles and has been elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2014. And today we are very glad that she's going to present uh, a work that she has been uh, developing her lab, harnessing crop improvement traits from semi-domesticated tomato accessions. So thank you very much, Esther. Um, now you can share your screen, of course. Okay. Um, share screen. Share, there we go. Um, full screen. That's perfect. Get my pointer. Where is the pointer? Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you uh, for the invitation and thank you all for your patience. I'm about uh, what half hour late, I guess. Um, my presentation not super long, so I think we'll we might be able to finish it on time. So everybody, if you have other appointments after, um, it should be all right. Um, let me see. Let me maybe make the sun screens a little bit smaller here. <coughs> so um, again, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that we've been working on with a, a number of collaborators, um, and it's about harnessing crop improvement traits from uh, semi-domesticated tomato accession. So, not very much of this work has been published because um, we're in the as you'll see from the presentation in the cloning of the genes uh, phase, which uh, with quantitative traits also is always is a little bit challenging, uh, even though on paper, it sounds like very quick. <clears throat> Anyways, so this is a nice overview picture that my graduate student Alexis Ramos made from uh, the, the plants that we grew in this collection. So if we wanna harness uh, crop improvement rate, um, in tomato, you want to use semi-domesticated accessions. It's very important to understand the, the evolutionary history of the tomato. So and this is work done um, that we published uh, uh, a year ago, Hamid Razifart in Anna Casado's lab, on uh, a detailed analysis um, that, that used genome sequences of quite a large uh, collection of, of tomato accessions. And from that, um, uh, the, the, the basically on the evolution, of, um, um, it, it became clear that, or it was already known that tomato uh, originated here in South America. Uh, it evolved from a, a fully wild Solanum pimpanella folium to a Solanum like a Persicum soraciformi or SLC in, in Ecuador and Peru. Uh, then uh, the data suggests that the, the tomato um, moved northward, we don't know quite how, um, to uh, northern South America and Central America and Mexico, where it further evolved into the fully cultivated tomato or Solanum lycopersicum lycopersicum SLL. And the numbers behind here uh, indicate the, 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 these were the accessions that we had in, in our, our study. So of course, this trajectory of the evolution uh, was based on uh, the, this phylogenetic analysis that Hamid uh, uh, did, uh, that once once you uh, assemble, you know, have genome sequence uh, assembled and and um, 
I, I, you know, working with uh, polymorphisms and SNPs uh, to make a phylogenetic tree of the entire genome. This is, this is kind of how the phylogeny of tomato um, is, is constructed. So in, in the most ancestral tomatoes are, of course, the Pimpinella foliums from, from um, uh, Ecuador and, and uh, Peru. The Pimpinella folium from northern Ecuador is actually closest to the first Saraciformi uh, accessions in Ecuador. And then uh, tomato further evolved to SLC Peru, um, SLC Mexico, and toward, in the end, into the fully cultivated tomato. So um, what was one of the most striking findings from this, and this I think uh, folks in the audience might find interesting as well, that uh, Hamid did molecular dating of these subpopulations and, and found actually that based on his calculations that the SLC arose uh, quite a while ago, 78, uh, about 78,000 uh, 78, years ago, which obviously predates uh, domestication by a lot. So uh, from that, um, if, if SLC arose that long ago, then it's unlikely that S SP, the Solanum pimpinella folium, is the direct ancestor of cultivated tomato, but it's more likely that pimpinella folium evolved um, into an ancestral SLC that then gave rise to the SLC in Ecuador and, and all the other SLCs and eventually into cultivated tomato. So the distance between cultivated tomato and SLC max, for example, is about 7,000 years, and that's much more consistent with um, you know, the domestication uh, timing. So how can we, so uh, interesting, my lab was well, like, how can we harness this evolutionary knowledge for crop improvement? And a, a big question was, uh, were any alleles uh, perhaps left behind? Um, and um, if so, yeah, how, how we go after them. So most, we always assume that um, domestication was kind of a linear trajectory, but we actually don't know. And we certainly don't know uh, in, in, um, in cultivated, in, 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 in fruits and vegetables, how domestication, uh, how, how actually the trajectory of that was. Maybe uh, early farmers were more interested in certain flavor profiles than we are now. So it is possible, or, and, and fr fruit sizes perhaps too, it's possible that some uh, alleles may have been left behind. So of course, that was an open question when we started it five years ago. So um, this is the theme in my lab. I study mostly fruit morphology, but we also have a project on the volatile um, uh, profiles of tomato, and that's in collaboration with Denise Thiemann in, uh, at the University of Florida. But I won't be talking about that today. I'll only focus on fruit morphology. So what's the importance of produce morphology? It's often, it's not often the main focus uh, in many research projects, but it is really important when you're a breeder and you want to release a new variety uh, because uh, the, the overall size and the shape of the produce is, is quite critical to define a certain market class. Um, so for example, um, for the fresh market uh, in tomato, there's there's def definitely uh, categories like the large uh, globe or beefsteak tomatoes and the small uh, cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. And they're clearly used for different purposes. If you look at other vegetables like, like peppers, for example, there, there's a whole other um, uh, category like the spices. Um, the certain types of peppers are used for more for spice than for eating fresh, um, et cetera. Size and shape obviously is very easily recognized by consumers. So uh, the grape tomato is a good example. That is a, a type of tomato didn't exist about 20 years ago, but it defined a whole new market class uh, as an improvement of the cherry tomato, a small tomato, but it further uh, enhanced characteristics like disease resistance and, and, and increased shelf life. So of course, size and shape are also optimized for the harvesting methods, whether they're by hand, uh, or mechanical. Um, if, if they're uh, by hand, uh, it, it may make not too much uh, difference whether the fruit is larger or smaller, but uh, as, as, a, as a way of uh, whether the farmer's gonna uh, make a profit or, uh, or um, uh, get, it, get the cost of his production under control, the bigger, the better typically. Um, 
for harvesting using uh, you know, mechanical harvesting and, and the conveyor belts, it's also very important that shape and size are consistent with the machinery. Otherwise, uh, that will create uh, problems uh, down the road. So the internal structures of the pericarp are also helpful when you have a large tomato next time you slice it open you'll see this internal structures you can see the different locules or the cavities where the seeds are are housed and that internal structure is actually meant to keep the slice intact and that the, the seeds don't drop out and you basically have a ring <clears throat> so i don't have to uh defend this result very much uh fruit weight variation in these subpopulations from different uh, Solanum pimpinella foliums, three different categories to several categories of Solanum, uh, like the Prescrim seraciformi, the SLC, to the last one is the SLL. Uh, that fruit weight varies, obviously, and everybody knows, I think, in this audience who works on tomato that the pimpinella foliums are tiny. They, uh, their fruit's about um, uh, one to two grams. Uh, they really don't vary much in fruit size in, in, in the wild species. But then fruit size increases clearly, as you can see um, in the SLC. And another um, uh, note in this graph too is that, so the SLC Ecuador, that's this category, has some really large fruit uh, uh, in, its, uh, in its, its germplasm. Um, also this one, uh, SLC San Martin, that's in a region in Peru, there's one variety that makes quite large fruit, while the SLC from um, uh, northern South America, Central America, Mexico, and the Mexico SLC, um, they, they, their average fruit weight actually goes down. So there was another finding in, in Hamid's paper that it looks like maybe a tomato de-domesticated a little or went feral, or, and then from that it was further domesticated into this uh, cultivated tomato. Obviously the large fruited alleles were actually in, in the germplasm, but just the average was, had a much lower fruit weight. Of course, other explanations are possible too, but that's one of the uh, uh, conclusions that could be made from the data that uh, Hamid and Anna presented. So um, the other thing is important to know um, is the genetic diversity uh, in these different subtypes. And that's uh, the foundation, of course, find, to find, um, you know, it, crop improvement alleles is that you want to work with diverse germplasm uh, and not with germplasm that is uh, much more um, monomorphic, I guess. So, of course, again, the pimpinella foliums are highly diverse. As you can see, uh, they have high level of genetic diversity among them. But the SLC from Ecuador is equally diverse. So that is obviously a very good source uh, for uh, crop improvement traits are the SLC from Ecuador. And the SLL, uh, the, our collection was not super uh, large, but it, it is, has, has, as expected, much lower diversity. So uh, we wanted to study uh, fruit weight um, uh, more complexly. Uh, it's a very quantitative trait. Uh, and so our thought was that, well, if we divide uh, the components of weight up in different segments, perhaps we can uh, more reliable identify uh, genes that control that aspect of fruit weight. So what am I talking about? Now, weight simply, you can count, you can weigh the fruit. We typically weigh 20, and then we get the average of that. You can also look at locule number. Here's a, a good example of a fruit that kind of uh, empty, empty spaces. So there's, you can count the locules really well. The more locules the fruit makes, uh, the, the larger the weight. So to um, find the fruit weight components, oh, sorry. Um, what we did is we used our uh, software program that we developed in our lab called Tomato Analyzer. Uh, and we took scanned images of tomato fruit. You see there's the cross sections and all work done by Alexis uh, in our lab um, a couple of years ago. And then with the tomato analyzer software program, you can analyze the, the area of the pericarp, the pericarp and the septum, as well as the columella. That's the central part uh, of the, the, the fruit and the seeds and are attached to this. 
So that's that's one aspect is the is the pericarp enlarged is uh, the columella enlarged, and the other aspect is to look actually at cell number and cell size because if you have a larger pericarp if the pericarp thickness is thicker, that uh, can be due to a combination of factors. Uh, number one is the number of cells um, in this cross section or in the abaxial adaxial direction, and you can measure the cell size too. You can see here that it's very variable, but our method was to analyze uh, the largest cells, find the five to 10 largest cells in, a, in, a, in, a, in an image like this, avoiding the uh, vascular bundles and evaluate the size of those. Another way of, of, of uh, another dimension of growth is of course the medial lateral directions in its circumference. And we calculated that we didn't count, you know, the cells in the medial lateral direction because it's incredibly cumbersome and it's hard to get images like this for a whole food. So we used the um, the, the cell size and then the air, uh, the diameter of the food as a way to calculate how many cells would be in this circumference, and that's growth in the medial lateral direction. Another aspect we wanted to uh, study, the, the reason why I, I like to work on, on fruit shape and fruit size is because it, it tells us something about the development of the fruit. So um, that's, you have to consider that in the end of the day or the end of the season, we're, we're looking at the ripe fruit, but the growth of that fruit occurred obviously much earlier uh, after uh, anthesis during the fruit development phase but it could even happen earlier than that, way earlier, namely in the floral meristem or perhaps even the apical meristem. So if a floral meristem is larger, it will probably create a larger uh, fruit in the end. So there's different uh, developmental stages where changes in fruit weight um, can uh, occur. So this is our end goal that we actually understand you know, genes that, uh, that um, affect a certain part of the fruit growth and during a certain time of development, or maybe some genes affect development continuously. So this slide is a lot of information. And if you don't care about the tedious details, you can tune out for two slides and we'll get back to fruit weight uh, soon. <laughs> Uh, oh, this is again a slide of the, the fruit weight that shows you know, very low fruit weight in the, in the Pimpinella foliums, uh, increased fruit weight in the Seraciformi, and then a much increased fruit weight in uh, cultivated tomato. And if you then uh, plot this out for the pericarp area, you see a very similar pattern. No surprise. So the pericarp area enlarges, but so does the area, the pericarp and septum as well as the columella. So all parts of the fruit enlarge in, the, in, in, a, in this population of 160 plants. So uh, this is of course on average. So, uh, so what was, we then thought what's actually more interesting is if the pericarp area preferentially enlarge, enlarges um, in, in one uh, group of accessions versus another. So we took the pericarp area and divided it over the total fruit area, and then you get a fraction. And what you see here, actually, interestingly enough, that there's no preferential increase in, in general from, from the all the way the smallest fruit, Pimpinella folium, to the largest fruit. You know, the averages are about the same. So um, it's not that the pericarp gets any larger, the whole, the whole, the whole fruit gets larger. The interesting exception of that was, was the columella. So the columella is indeed uh, quite small in the pimpies and almost all the Saraciformis, but the columella area uh, appears to enlarge quite a bit in these SLCs in our collection. So the next slide shows, oh, sorry, printing, pushing the wrong button. The next slide shows what it means at cell size and cell number. Um, well, cell, again, we were hoping to simplify traits. <laughs> Uh, cell size um, um, or simplify the fruit, uh, fruit weight by looking at its component. Cell size increases similarly from being the smallest in the Pimpinella folium, increasing in size in Saraciformi and are the greatest in the cultivated tomato. And so um, the cell number in the pericarp is actually showing a very similar pattern. Again, the Pimpies have the fewest cells and the cultivated have the most cells. 
And then in the medial lateral uh, uh, direction, it, it's similar that the pimpinelliformi, most of soraciformi have about the same number of cells in the circumference of the fruit, uh, but the cultivated tomato has uh, the most. So um, another way of, of, of looking at this is to um, look at the distribution of the known fruit ray genes, because we want to identify uh, genes that have not been identified yet, and we no, don't want to map and clone the same genes again. So fortunately, um, uh, in our lab, but also uh, in Steve Tangsley's lab uh, and, and uh, Mathilde Costa's lab, uh, several fruit ray genes uh, and other genes, LC and FAS, that are uh, controlling loculin, but are associated with fruit ray, they've been cloned. Uh, we use um, uh, uh, the, the causative allele uh, marker or a marker that is, you know, highly, highly associated with, with that, uh, that particular allele. So we know uh, fruit rate 2.2, 3.2, 11.3. We know in all these sub subpopulations, the Pimpinella folliums to the SLC, SLL, the fully cultivated tomato, whether they carry the cultivated allele or the wild type allele of, of, of these three fruit ray genes and these two uh, fruit shape genes. And so purple is wild and blue is uh, uh, cultivated. So you'll see again, uh, similarly to the domestication that the pimpies are mostly carrying just the wild alleles with the exception here of LC. There's two accessions in Northern Ecuador that have actually the, the mutation in the LC uh, locus. LC gene, the loctinoma gene. Um, then the cultivated allele frequency or the derived allele frequency increases in SLC Ecuador, in Peru, uh, in some, San Martin is a small collection, but some, some alleles are completely fixed, fruit rate 2.2 and LC. And then some de-domestication, the alleles, uh, the, the derived alleles are, are, are disappearing in uh, Mexico, Central America, Northern South America, as well as in Mexico. And then again, further domestication in fully cultivated, but most of the fruit weight genes uh, are actually fixed with the exception of FAS because that's, uh, that gives a very undesirable fruit with lots of bumps and stuff like that. So this is actually often selected against. Another interesting way of plotting this information is actually to look at the allele combination. So this was done um, you know, in, in with, with our accessions, but we have seen similar results with near isogenic lines, is that if all the alleles are wild type, the fruit is pretty small, but you do see some, you know, a fruit of almost 20 grams here. Um, and then one means that it has the derived allele of the first gene here, fruit weight 2.2, that increases fruit size a little, but not much. And basically what I want you to take away from this is that when you get to this group of uh, accessions, uh, they actually have the cultivated allele or the derived allele of fruit weight 11.3 is the, the number one uh, in, this, the, in the middle of the series of five. So that means they have the cultivated allele of 11.3. And that's quite interesting because we, we spend a bit of time cloning 11.3 and it was uh, a minor QTL in an F2, but it appears in this, the way we plot it out here, uh, that it was quite crucial for the domestication of tomato to get it to a larger uh, fruit size. So uh, Hamid uh, uh, did, did the phylogenetic analysis, but also a lot of GWAS because we had the whole genome sequence and we had all this phenotype information. And so here is an example uh, of for uh, GWAS result for fruit weight, for cell size, for cell number and for cell number in the circumference. And uh, the most significant um, signals came from uh, the genes that we knew. So in this fruit way 2.2 region uh, and fruit way 3.2 region are clearly associated with uh, fruit weight in a GWAS study. Uh, we didn't find actually 11.3 in here, but we do find a few other, uh, like the bottom of six and the bottom of eight but they're not as significant as the known genes. We could not find any um, um, region of the genome associated significantly with cell size, 
with cell number, um, we found chromosome two again, fruit weight 2.2 and, and a locus on chromosome eight. And cell number circumference, we found a locus on chromosome eight and 11. Um, and uh, that's possibly due to the locular number and fasciated genes. So they're, they're making a larger fruit because there are more locules. And then you know you you will get a, a, a larger cell number in the circumference of the fruit. So this was uh, very uh, interesting and helpful. But like at the moment, we saw some interesting uh, GWAS signals, but uh, we 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 were not entirely sure if we should bet the farm on those at, at this point. And also um, the the population was a reasonable size but 160 is, is a bit small perhaps to really break up linkage groups. So LD was fairly high, so it wasn't so easy to uh, pick out a candidate gene region um, uh, from the data, but we did our best. So uh, we did our best and also created a lot of them by parental mapping populations to, to validate these, these novel uh, GWAS loci, the one on six and eight. And so we generated uh, a lot of populations that um, were not segregating for the known fruit weight genes. Um, again, we don't wanna map the same uh, genes. Um, we also selected populations act to create populations that differed in fruit weight and were all evolutionary closer. Uh, so on that phylogenetic tree that they weren't like on opposite ends of the phylogenetic tree. So to try and map transitions of domestication, for example, tr transitions in evolution of tomato. So we created a total of 26 F2 populations over several years, and they're always growing in the field um, in Georgia, uh, up in the mountains in Blairsville, or in, 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 in um, Live Oak in Florida with our collaborators there. We have also done some work in Vidalia, southern Georgia. And then we employed a QTL seq to map these, these major QTLs in, in, in three, QTL, um, three populations. And so this is the uh, result of the QTL seq from, uh, from the three populations. So uh, the Delta SNP index uh, in this population shows there is a locus on chromosome one. Uh, this is a locus on chromosome two in another population. And in, in this last population, we found two QTLs. Um, uh, on chromosome uh, three and on chromosome eight. So the one on chromosome eight was the new one, uh, the one that we identified in the GWAS. So I do have to admit, we did a suboptimal selection of the bulk. So this, this, this QTL seq does not look very uh, promising. Um, but when we then used markers around these, these loci at the bottom of chromosome one, uh, sorry, chromosome three, and map that in the entire population, we, we could confirm um, this, this, this F2 result. So it's one year uh, result. So this is a summary of, of uh, what we found. And I do not want you to read it all in detail because that's not important. Maybe I just want to impress you how much work it was <laughs> because this was a lot of work uh, by the lab. So we identified uh, at least these three QTLs, 1.1, 2.3, and uh, 3.3. And I'll tell you a little bit later about eight. Um, so, so these are the three QTLs that were identified in these three different populations. But for example, 1.1 was also identified in three other populations and with different crosses. So this is an SLC by Ecuador and an, an SP cross. SLC Ecuador by an SLC from Central America cross. So there are different SLC Ecuador, SLC Peru cross. Sorry, my, my cat scared me. Oh, gee. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> my cat is like going crazy. I think she sees a chipmunk outside. <clears throat> um, so there, there are three additional populations in, uh, th that segregate for the QTL on chromosome one. Retail and chromosome two um, uh, have actually quite a number, like eight different populations that appear to segregate for the same QTL. Um, similarly for 3.3. So this does not prove it's the same QTL and the same gene, obviously, because we all know that uh, there could be linkage, there could be additional fruit weight genes on chromosome two, for example, that's, that's likely. 
So, but, but at least this initial study uh, indicated all these different segregating populations uh, may be actually segregating for this same set of three um, QTLs. So, um, so we, but we actually, to combine now the GWAS result and the QTLC confirmation of these novel fruit weight genes, uh, novel fruit weight QTLs, uh, it might not be a novel fruit weight QTL, I should say, it, it's just, it's, it's a gene that hasn't been cloned. Um, many people have mapped the QTL for fruit weight in, in tomato and it's, there's, there's QTLs on every chromosome, but these are the ones that have not been cloned. So these were, this is kind of a summary of the different population that I showed. So for example, this particular cross here, uh, we targeted uh, the chromosome six um, uh, GWAS, but we could not detect it in the F2. This other population, we targeted chromosome eight and that was detected. But then when we tried to follow up the following year, we could not um, uh, associate that locus with fruit weight. That does not mean it's not real. It just means it's possibly more variable uh, QTL, more environmental control, et cetera. So uh, again, we did confirm chromosome one and chromosome three, but what I wanna talk about in the remainder of the talk is um, about the locus on chromosome two. So, um, I'm showing this uh, results to get uh, to share with you what what were we expecting. So the fruit weight between the two parents was hugely different. Um, again, they're both actually SLC, but um, the SLC from Ecuador 67, 68 makes fruits that are over 15 grams, and the SLC from uh, Mexico 79, 31 uh, their fruit is about two or three grams, very low, very small. And in this case, uh, between these two parents, the pericarp area ratio was larger in the BGV 67, 68, suggesting that the pericarp was preferentially in a, in large, enlarged between these two parents. If you're looking again at cell size, cell size was hugely different um, uh, between uh, these two parents, but also cell layer. So the number of cells uh, in the abaxial dextral direction uh, was different, even though you may think, oh, there's not that much, 10 to 14, but that's actually quite a bit. While the cell so number in the circumference was not uh, different between these parents. And then the developmental aspect. So does the growth, the, or does, yeah, does this growth difference, because weight is a growth difference, does it occur during the development of the ovary or during the development of the fruit? So we uh, analyzed similarly um, um, the cell size and cell number in the ovary of these two parents and then compared how much uh, they increased in the mature fruit that's shown here. And here's a fold increase. It's very similar, uh, but just differently, uh, slightly differently analyzed. So if you see a difference here, uh, uh, that means that the, the pericarp thickness is, is, is uh, en en enlarging during um, um, the, the fruit development, but that's not due to the pericarp cell layer. So the cell layers are already set. Uh, there's no uh, greater increase in number of cells in the pericarp from the ovary to the fruit. And instead it's the cell size that is uh, increasing a lot more during fruit development in the large fruited parents. So this is kind of a summary of that. So um, the, the differences between the parents uh, indicate, uh, suggest that they are, that fruit weight is controlled by differential growth of the pericarp. It controls, it appears to be controlled by pericarp cell size as well as cell number, but cell size is manifesting itself during fruit development after anthesis and the cell layer difference appears to uh, manifest itself through a floral development. So Alex has measured all, all of these detailed traits because actually uh, pericarp area stuff is not so hard to measure. But cell size and cell number was very hard to measure. Um, it was very laborious um, because of all microscopy slides <coughs> and, and tedious. Uh, but he mapped, he, he uh, analyzed all of it in the F2 population. And here are the, 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 the marker association on chromosome two and on chromosome six uh, with these different traits. So where does chromosome six come from? We didn't know there was anything on six, but because 
we didn't think to look there, but we the QTL seq actually identified something on chromosome six, and we uh, it's included here. We're not at the moment pursuing this one as much. But so what you can see is the pedicarp area, columella area clearly in, increased. Um, but for the ratio, uh, even though the pericarp uh, appears to enlarge more in the one parent than the other, it's, it's, we don't find a, a locus on chromosome two to be significant, maybe the one here on six. Um, but the columella area ratio appears to increase in chromosome two. And then pericarp cell layer, uh, we do an, see an increase indeed uh, with, you know, or we, we see an increase in significance um, uh, towards the bottom of chromosome two for both cell layer and also pericarp cell size. Perhaps these QTLs are, are, are not the same, but we don't know. At the moment, it looks like the locus can control both. And this is just to say, like, we made so much effort in, in, in measuring cells and measuring their size to only come to a conclusion that uh, the gene may control both. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyways. So from that, we went on to do the fine mapping and we have not studied much the cell parameters anymore, but just weighing uh, the fruit, that's a lot faster. And after a few years, uh, now last or so, two summers ago, uh, we uh, got to this region on chromosome two. Uh, it's, it's a little bit further fine map, but this is still largely the region of interest. We don't have many more recombinants here. And interestingly enough, and this is kind of making it a puzzle for us, but it maps, um, well, the fruit way 2.2 gene is right in this area. So um, we stared at the function of these other genes. Uh, there's none that stands out. Um, we did find two genes that are differentially expressed between the parents, but we're not sure if the time point that we took um, is indicative. But anyway, the two genes differentially expressed, so that's interesting. Uh, based on SNPs, there are some SNPs, but none of them like clearly knocking a gene out. And we've studied extensively the structural variants in this region with um, a collaboration with Zach Lippmann. And, um, uh, that, that's, that's been very useful for, for other regions of the genome, but not for this one, in the sense that there's no major structural variant other than a 600 base pair deletion somewhere, a, a very intergenic region. So this is where we are. Well, now to the question of did any allele, was, is it possible that any allele was left behind? Um, and so is, and, and is this another, uh, version of fruitway 2.2. We don't know that if this is another version of 2.2, but was there an allele left behind? And uh, possibly. So this is again uh, the phylogeny uh, of tomatoes, kind of in a mirror image than what I showed earlier, Hamid's image. So this is done, this haplotype analysis is done with this fine map region only. And so again, you see the Pimpinella foliums here, but then we have here the Sarasiformi and here cultivated tomato. Um, just if you wondered why, why are the color coded, uh, Lay tried to color code them based on Hamid's uh, uh, color coding. So that's why there's different colors. Anyways, Fruitway 2.2 mutation uh, arose here. And this whole cluster here is 2.2. Has this has the cultivated allele of 2.2. And so clearly uh, our two parents map in a different clade. They're actually quite closely related. Um, uh, that is uh, is not found in cultivated tomato, and so here is is a close up uh, a close up view of the two parents. So seventy nine thirty one is um, the small parent from uh, Central America, and then BGV sixty seven sixty eight is the large parent from uh, Ecuador, and these these two other accessions all carry the large allele of. Uh, um, of this fruit weight uh, 2.3 uh, gene locus. So with that, I want to conclude that uh, SLC arose uh, about 80,000 years ago as a, as a, as a, as a wild. And uh, the data suggests uh, that indeed it was domesticated in Ecuador and Peru. Um, and certainly we know that uh, there was 
tomato was sold at markets uh, that are clearly SLC in Ecuador and Peru and, and uh, Northern South America. So there's clearly uh, some level of domestication that went on in South America. It appears that tomato became more feral though, uh, as it migrated to Mexico before be, uh, become uh, fully uh, domesticated. So the GWAS and biparental populations show evidence of, of novel food weight and weight related loci that have not been characterized and we're still uh, working on that. And it is possible that this, uh, this situation, this, this locus food weight uh, 2.3 indicated some alleles indeed, even for food weight were left behind during domestication. And with that, I wanna finish my talk and point out uh, the people in the lab that worked on this particular project. So this picture was taken more than a year ago because that's why we're all maskless. So this is Alexis uh, uh, who did a ton of the preparatory work, I should say that now is uh, continued by Lei Zeng in the lab, uh, as well as by Lara uh, Pereira and Manoj Saprota uh, is a graduate student on this project. And last but not least, I wanna uh, also thank uh, the NSF funded team working on this project. So quite a diverse team. I've mentioned Anna Casedo at, at UMass and Hamid Rassifard. They did a lot of the uh, evolutionary work and uh, the GWAS analysis. Uh, the population came from uh, the Germ Bank uh, Center in, uh, in, in uh, Valencia by Maria Jose Diaz, she's the curator of the uh, germ uh, bank and with collaborations with uh, Joaquin uh, and Jose, Joaquin Canizares and Jose Blanca being really uh, instrumental of actually working with the right population for these questions. Um, by the way, this is a picture of Hamid. In Florida, I didn't talk at all about our volatile work that we do in collaboration with Denise Tiemann and the postdoc Libby Frick. Um, at Cornell, we have Lucas Muller and, and Faye, here's, Faye is here in the picture and Nama is in the picture. So a lot of our work has been posted uh, on, at, at the SGN um, website, actually all of it, uh, under the Variton project. Um, also collaboration with uh, Ying Wang at Mississippi State on, on uh, some expression analysis. And I always uh, work uh, for outreach with folks um, uh, at the College of Worcester uh, particularly Sofia Visa and Dean Frage. These are two professors at the College of Worcester that uh, uh, often participate in our research um, uh, projects. And so with that, I uh, have uh, finished my presentation. It's a few minutes, I think, after 11, so not too bad. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Esther. It was a great presentation and very complete and very interesting. So the, the first question is from Nuncio D'Agostino. Uh, he said like thorough GWBA in pepper for fruit morphology and size, and we found a signal on chromosome three. The associated SNPs was in the third exon of a longifolia one-like gene that is involved in the activation of longitudinal organ expansion. Do you find any similar evidence in tomato? Um, let me actually make sure uh, something on three. That's interesting. Longifolia gene. Oh, yes, oh, um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, longifolia. Yeah, so, okay, you're, you're mixing it up. My head starts uh, going in another direction now because <laughs> All our work on fruit shape is very much on the, what was called the longifolia genes, but they're now renamed to the TRIM, so the Tono one recruitment uh, motif family. And we published a paper uh, on that. Um, as far as I know in tomato, um, there is no evidence, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We haven't found it yet. That fruit shape in tomato is controlled by longifolia genes, by the TRIM genes. But there, we, we, are, we also have a small pepper project and we did indeed find a, a, a trim or longifolia gene associated with food shape in pepper. I forgot, um, it's also on three, but not, well, maybe, yeah, maybe it's the same. Maybe it's the same um, study that uh, Dago is, is, is referring to. So um, 
Yeah, no, that's very interesting. So longifolia genes or trim genes have been found in cucumber, um, in rice grain shape, uh, certainly in Arabidopsis leaf and silic shape. So the longifolia genes are incredibly important in controlling shape. I don't know per, per se about size, but the shape for sure. That's right. Yeah, and we, we actually look look for, for those, for our, our known candidate or, you know, our, our favorites. So OV genes are always interesting, but um, yeah, uh, they, they're, they're not really mapping there. There's certainly right now for 2.3, there's no OV or trim or, or anything that's like, oh, that must be it. That's right. Then there is a question of Richard Muster. Um, do you want to turn on your microphone and ask directly or do you want me to ask for you? Well, I can do it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was intrigued by your suggestion that some of the uh, populations that were closer to the SLL, the, the populations of SLC that were closer to SLL had seemed to revert <clears throat> or in their term de-domesticated a bit. And I wonder if that's because they were no longer being selected by humans uh, once the SLL became cultivated and they started to revert to more of a wild type or an ancestral type? Do you have any? Yeah, and I see uh, Hamid is in the audience and I'll, I'll let Hamid <coughs> answer because he's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I have to clarify that when we say the domestication, it's from the original SLC, not from SLL. And um, in our analyses, we found out that uh, Mexican SLC and the uh, SLC in Central um, America and Northern South America have more genetic diversity than cultivated tomato. So the, it's possible that they are the ancestral population. So one hypothesis is that they might have gone uh, released from selective pressure uh, after they originated in Ecuador. But the other hypothesis is that, um, so uh, one hypothesis that they have been released from pressure and um, then the other hypothesis is that um, maybe uh, uh, they, uh, they, really, they were um, spread northward uh, by birds or other, uh, uh, other organisms. I, I wasn't sure if I answered your question. Yeah, that's, that, that's good. Thank you. So, so Dick, you know, I, I've always thought this and it's so great. Mm -hmm. Esther, it's so wonderful to hear all that and Hamid, great work, it's fantastic. Thank you. So I've done the experiment, where, which is not really an experiment. It's my kind of experiment. It's not your kind of proper experiment where I've just let tomatoes grow. I just leave them to self seed season after season. And a few years in, they have smaller fruits because they're just not, they can't maintain it. You know, they just, they, they may have, it may, it may be that that gene gets selected out because it's just, you know, anything that has it doesn't survive, but, but you get the, so, you, so it's not a controlled thing, but I can really imagine that once released from being kind of carefully cultivated and things left to go feral, like, like Esther said in the slide, that they would not revert back, but that the populations would kind of go back to having smaller fruits. Yeah, there, there is also, I see MJ is in the audience. I, um, there's also really nice work done right now by uh, the, the manuscript has been, has been written. I think it's almost ready to submit. That where so Hamid uh, looked at the entire genome and making inferences based on the entire genome. Mm -hmm. And what Jose Blanca and uh, Timo Canizares did, they looked at haplotypes and looked whether, um, you know, how, how haplotypes were related to one another. So then you kind of break up the chromosome into more smaller se sections that. Uh, may actually reveal an other story as well. And, you know, which one is more likely is unclear, but what their data suggests um, is that actually SP evolved into SLC uh, as it migrated north. So something SP, SLC migrating north, and that um, the SLC then in, in, in 
central north and central america mexico um, actually started becoming domesticated and then there must have been a lot of traffic back and forth <laughs> and so some of these accessions actually went back to uh, ecuador where then there was a fair bit of um, hybridization with the wild pimpy population so there's a lot of ancient admixture and uh, uh, while also uh, you know giving rise to cultivated tomato in mexico so that actually would suggest there wasn't a de-domestication but more that there were, um, there was further evolution and then it kind of split up in two parts so the uh, south yeah, american not super hard to kind of tease out the differences it is of course those accessions aren't the ones that went back no exactly and we have we don't have that many yeah uh, we have very few in the transition right hamid we we don't have that many that were and migrating kind of, and, and there's been so much overlay of human transport of everything since then that it's almost going to be impossible to, to tease out yeah but you you can look at haplotype blocks right like i think the size is 500 kb something like that mm -hmm only in the euchromatic regions, and they, they could tell a very complex story, <laughs> but it's well, another but, but it's also true that this happened pre, this, this business of going back and forth happened pre-European colonization of the Americas. Yeah. And so any, any accessions we have now are our historical, our, our current historical, historical artifacts. So, so, so I think it's I, I think it's super interesting. But I think what you found is so interesting. This, you know, and it and it and it's a, there's a lot of evidence for that. There's a lot of evidence from archaeology that there's there was a huge amount of intercultural exchange between ah. South and Central America, pre, pre 1492. I mean, I've found, I found yeah. gold things in Panama that are clearly Colombian in origin, you know, and in Costa Rica. So, so you know, I, I think I think that's kind of it's fascinating and, and it's so too bad that there's no pottery and there's no seeds and there's no, you know, all the archeological stuff that there is in Peru. There's absolutely nothing that you can unequivocally pin to tomatoes, which is- I know, I know. I visited, uh, the, I visited the potato center once in Peru and I was like, it was for a collection uh, pet. And I thought maybe pet is in the audience still. I don't know, but this, and it was like it was so disappointing to to not see much tomato at all, actually. But yeah. Well, yeah, and I and I went I went back to behind the scenes once in one of those archaeological museums that has um, all the pottery. They let me into the kind of stores because I was just looking for things that looked like tomatoes, and 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 there was nothing. I couldn't yeah. see anything that even that I could vaguely kind of pretend was it. Yeah. I would have loved it. <laughs> Yeah, great, great discussion, everyone. Nice, nice to have you in the audience, the, the, the systematicist. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And actually, uh, there is also a question related to all this uh, discussion uh, from Katia. And she's saying where and when the SLC was originated and where it has been domesticated. Yeah, so um, uh, in, in, in Hamid's wonderful paper, uh, the idea is that uh, that SLC originated in Ecuador, and it has then also been initially domesticated there, but it wasn't. It didn't lead to the final product. So the final product is SLL, and that that happened in Mexico. Um, then the other um, uh, hypothesis is that uh, SP and SLC uh, evolved into SLC along the trajectory northwards. Um, whether that was by human selection or, well, initially not, 75, 78,000 years ago, probably not. So, you know, the dating of Hamid is still very consistent with um, the origin of these different uh, groups. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, there is any other question um, from the people. If you have any question, you can drop it in the chat or otherwise you can turn on your microphone and and Didi, if you want, and some questions. Or just send me an email, that's okay. Of course, yes. <laughs> yes, remember that we can always like use the Google Groups to have discussions uh, during this time. I think, Sandy, you? No, I just want to say thank you very much to my sister, Esther. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Nap. They always misspell my name. It's terrible. And mine too. Mine too. The other way. We should just change our names one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to correct it even at the university. And then, you know, I have to sometimes ask, you know, I can't enter this website or this is what I have. I'm blocked. It's like, oh, I have to misspell my own name to log in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We also did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's OK. But, you know, I know that it's you're just, different. It's like my university should have my actual name. <laughs> Your university doesn't know me. I mean, the thing is that when we're in the same kind of like group of people, people always misspell our names one for the other. So that's yeah. surprising. <laughs> yeah. It's very common to have the two P's at the end. So that's yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much, Esther. It was thank you. And of course, well, thank you everyone for attending this, uh, this first seminar. Um, next week, we have the seminar the Friday at the same time. And Mark Chase and Stephen Foxworth are going to present about the recent radiation of Nicosiana sexual flagellants in Australia, and specifically about cytogenetics, ecological, and phylogenomic, phylogenomic insights. So we, we hope to see you again next Friday, and thank you very much, everyone. Remember that all this, uh, this is recorded, and if it's okay for you, Esther, can you, we post that in YouTube, your talk of today? Um, um yeah that's okay that's perfect well thank you very much it's, although i have to say it's not published but we don't have too too much detailed information that somebody could immediately go in and post it <laughs> <laughs> okay okay well thank you very much everyone and see you next Friday. yep bye-bye <laughs> everyone